to our service this morning. Before we start, we used to get up and walk around and welcome each other. Let's just stand and wave at each other anyway. I see some new faces. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> I would like to welcome Elder Bonnie Pollard back to our pulpit this morning. Welcome, Bonnie. Uh, the announcements and events that are in our church for this week are listed in this uh, insert that we have. I just want to point out one that's a newbie for us for a while has been we have fellowship back. Yay. So after service, I think Betty's been working back there. Okay. Is there any other announcement that I need to be, or that we need to be aware of? No? And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you. 
Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sin. Amen. <laughs> from the second Samuel first verse, first chapter first verse and verses 17 to 27 David hears of Saul's death after the death of Saul David returned from striking down the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days David's lament for Saul and Jonathan David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan and he ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow that is written in the book of Joshua. I will sell lives slain on your heights, Israel, how the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Goth, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Mountains of Gilboa may have neither dew nor rain, may no showers fall on your terraced fields, for there the shield of the mighty was despised, the shield of Saul, no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, the sword of Saul. The buff, let's try this again. 
The bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in a life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain, slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You are very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. And from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 to 15. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have a desire to do so. Now finish the work that your eager willingness to do, it may be matched with your completion of it, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written. The one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered too little <coughs> did not have too little. <laughs> verses 21 to 43. Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. When Jesus had again crossed over the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman who was there had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was free from suffering. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone out of him. He turned around to the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see people crowding against you, the disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done that. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion, the people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they all laughed at him. After he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. 
He took her by the hand and said to her, which means, little girl, I say, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Good morning. Today I'm going to be singing the song Rescue by Lauren Daigle. You are not hidden, there's never been a moment You were forgotten, you are not hopeless Though you have been broken, your innocence stolen I hear you whisper underneath your breath I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkness. Night is true. I will rescue you. There is no distance that cannot be covered over and over. You're not defenseless. I'll be a shelter. I'll be your armor. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will. Send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue you. I will never stop marching to meet you. In the middle of the hardest fight, it's true, I will rescue you. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear you whisper you have nothing left. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the dark days. Night is true. I will rescue you. Stop marching to reach you in the middle of the hardest fight. It's true, I will rescue you. Oh, I will rescue you. Thank you, Mrs. 
sir. And now let us voice our concerns and our prayers to God. First for our world. Pray for our pastors and teachers and missionaries around the world for their health and for their safety. Thanksgiving for the beautiful heartfelt music. For our church. Prayers for our leaders here and leaders around the world. Um, let us be hearing God's voice in all we do. For the tragedy in Florida, people involved in the rescue. For friends and family, Gil and Lois. Ken Victor Staff and John Murphy. For Helen and Amy. For a safe journey to Florida for my son and his wife. For the Jones, Carr, Waukesha family, Dory Donis, Jim Tepper, Nana, <clears throat> for peace in our hearts. For Barbara Wolfgren. James Wolf. For the Vicar staff and the Evans families. Chief Ike. An end to the senseless warfare. For all families. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your grace in times of doubt and sorrow, for healing our diseases, for preserving our lives through temptation and danger, and for the love you've shown us in the giving of your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Would you join me now in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I thought at first, um, well, there doesn't look like too many people, but then I discovered they're all sitting over there. <laughs> so uh, it would be nice sometime if we were all together, wouldn't it? <laughs> anyway, for a number of weeks now, we have been studying the book of Mark. And as Pastor Steve has pointed out, Mark is a writer who loves action. And we saw this illustrated last week uh, when Jesus and his disciples set out to cross the Sea of Galilee to the other side. And in the middle of it came a terrific storm. Now, the storm was bad enough, but the disciples' great frustration was that they felt Jesus didn't care. He didn't care because he knew they were not going to all die. Jesus was in the boat, in the stern, sound asleep. He could sleep because he knew they weren't going to die. And when the disciples woke him to discuss their point of view, Jesus asked, where is your faith? After all this time, do you not have any faith? Then he told the storm to calm itself down which it did, and they sailed safely to the other side. The action, however, was not over because as Jesus got out of the boat on the other side of the lake, a demon-possessed man approached him. 
Uh, the lectionary that we use does not include this story, but in it, Mark tells us that immediately after Jesus and his disciples had arrived on the other side, this demon-possessed man approached Jesus. And the man we learn was possessed with a legion of evil spirits. I did not know how many a legion was. So I looked it up. The first thing it did was simply give me an illustration. Do you know that a legion, a Roman legion, was between 3,000 and 6,000 soldiers. That's a lot of soldiers, but it's a lot of evil spirits as well. Jesus eventually cast this legion of demons into a herd of pigs grazing in the nearby field. The pigs did not like the idea of a thousand or a couple thousand demons in them any more than the man did, and they rushed over a cliff into the lake and all drowned. The miracles of Jesus were not always received positively, and this whole pig thing really frightened the people of the area, and they simply asked Jesus, go away. We don't want you here. Please leave us. Mark, still in action mode, began the next segment of chapter 5, the one we were looking at this morning, with the words, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. It seems there's always a crowd around Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And when you have a crowd, you inevitably have some unpleasantness, some pushing and some shoving. And the exception to that rule is when someone of importance wants to see Jesus. And that seems to be what happened. Mark writes, then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. I have no doubt that it cost Jairus something to approach Jesus in this manner, because by this time in Jesus' ministry, the Jewish religious leaders were firm in their opposition to Jesus and to his teaching. And Jairus, who was an important leader in the local synagogue, would almost certainly have shared this attitude. But now, all he can think of was his dying daughter, who at 12 years of age is on the brink of adulthood. But for him, of course, would always be his little girl. My daughter is dying, my little daughter. So nothing mattered to him but the immediate need to get help for his daughter, and so he sought out Jesus. It seems to be apparent to me that the, his fellow Jewish leaders could not help. The doctors could not help. Perhaps they even tried the homemade medicine uh, that had been around for hundreds of years, but that neither could help. But maybe, just maybe, Jesus could. Ha have you ever been there? <laughs> you know, everything, you try everything, and then you go to God. I, I don't imagine any of us would admit it out loud, even though I just did, but I do it with unexplainable regularity. I have an issue, I have a problem, a situation that I need to fix. And I do everything I can think about. I talk to everybody I know who might be able to help. I do everything and I can not fix it. And I come to the point where I simply say, God, I can't fix this. Please help me. And that's where Jairus found himself. You know what for me is the most wonderful part of this story? Jesus didn't care 
what Jairus believed about him. He didn't question him about his doctrinal beliefs. He didn't tell him the parable of the mustard seed. And he didn't care how many things he had tried before he came to him. Jesus just saw a man emotionally agonizing in pain who was asking for his help. Mark ends his part of the story with, so Jesus went with him. Of course, Jesus went with him. Now, if you had never read this story before, you might have the expectation that Jesus arrived at Jairus' house. He went into the room where the little daughter was. He prayed over her. She was healed, and they all lived happily ever after. But life isn't very often like that, is it? Among the crowd was a woman who should not have been there. Because of her condition, she was unclean according to Jewish law. She was in the category of the leper, totally ostracized by society. She was a woman accustomed to being shunned, looked down upon as unclean, whom no one wanted to touch, let alone befriend. She had been afflicted with an issue of blood for 12 years and was, in fact, slowly dying. She'd been to many doctors who took her money but could not help her. She was now penniless, desperate, willing to break whatever man-made law was necessary to reach her last hope, the healer, Jesus of Nazareth. Her approach reflected who she was and how she expected it to be treated. She didn't expect to actually engage Jesus. Just reach out, touch his outer garment, and that would be enough. She would be healed. At this point, Jesus and Jairus were walking in the direction of Jesus' house, and so most of the crowd would have been behind them and had their backs to the woman when she finally found herself close enough to Jesus to reach out and touch, tentatively touch, his cloak. And two dramatic things happened. The woman knew that her bleeding had stopped, and she was healed. And Jesus came to an abrupt start, turned around, and asked a seemingly ridiculous question. Who touched me? Why would Jesus ask that? I mean, even the disciples were non-pulse. What do you mean, who touched you? Just look around you. But Jesus was looking for a specific person, the person who had touched him in desperation, but also in faith, because he had felt the power, the healing power, leave him. And he had a message for this person. When she fell at his feet and poured out her story, she received not only physical healing, but words to live by for the rest of her life. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. He called her daughter, not woman, not child, but daughter. Commentary, uh, commentator Ray, Ray Stedman tells us that the word daughter is used by Jesus only of this woman. Jesus had given her the gift of relationship something she had not had for 12 years. The gift of relationship to Jesus is one he offers to all of us. May we receive it as she did, in awe, holding nothing of herself back, and ultimately in great joy and a life restored. Jesus responded to this woman in front of the crowd because if he had just allowed the healing to happen and kept on going and, and not acknowledged it, who would have believed her? It wasn't like she was a cripple 
or blind, this was a personal infirmity. And Jesus was very sympathetic to that fact. And he knew that those who would have heard and seen the exchange would have spread the word on her behalf. Now, this was a fairly long exchange. And what in the world is Jairus doing all this time? Waiting patiently? <laughs> Probably not. But while Jesus is still speaking to the woman, a group of men from uh, Jairus's home came with heartbreaking and what Jairus would certainly have assumed was irrevocable news. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? A perfectly logical conclusion. But with I, what I see as, as really amazing nonchalance, Jesus simply ignored them. And speaking only to Jairus, he said, don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus didn't care what these men were saying. He knew that this wasn't the end of the story. Like Jairus, we don't know the future and how God may work in our lives. But Jesus did, and he does. His word to us is as it was to Jairus. Don't be afraid. Just believe. I know what some of you are thinking. Easier said than done. And yes, it is. And there will be those who scoff at us for taking that road. They scoffed at Jairus. She's dead. Give it up, man. They laughed at Jesus, which perhaps was even a worse taunt. But Jesus didn't care what they said or did. And apparently, neither did Jairus. Jairus could have said to Jesus, I really appreciate it that you came and were willing to go with me, but she's dead. It's too late. But he didn't. He went with Jesus and he entered that room where his dead daughter lay, and he witnessed resurrection firsthand. All I know to say in closing is that with the help of God and one another, we too can live by Jesus' words. Because Jesus does care for us with as much love and compassion as he cared for disciples in a sinking boat, a man possessed with a very large number of evil spirits, a woman with an issue of blood, and a grieving father. Go, do not be afraid. Just believe. Go in peace. <coughs> Jesus.